Welcome back. This is the Voice of Russia in London, our weekly program from our three main studios in London, Washington DC and Moscow. My name is Brendan Cole. This week, Iran's president, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, said he would appeal to the country's supreme leader, the Ayatollah Khomeini, to overturn a ban stopping his aide, Esfandi Rahim Mashai, from running in next month's elections. Also out of the frame in the ballot is the former president, Akbar Rafsanjani, who was seen as a candidate who possibly could get the support of both pro-reform and centrist politicians. He was critical of the violence meted out to protesters in the wake of the disputed elections in 2009, which delivered a victory for Ahmadinejad, but was followed by accusations of vote rigging. Some analysts say that the list of eight names, which has been approved by the country's Guardian Council, means the Supreme Leader wants to have a calmer election this time round. The stakes are high, not just for Iranians, who have been suffering under Western-imposed sanctions. The election is also significant for the region, given disputes over the Islamic Republic's nuclear program and the insistence by Israel to act to ensure Iran does not get a nuclear weapon. Also, the conflict in neighbouring Syria, whose government forces has the tacit backing of Tehran, although Iran will not be present at talks next month that have been brokered by Russia and the US aimed at ending the violence. So what's in store? for the election in Iran and its aftermath. What is its significance for the region? Well, to discuss this and the issues surrounding it, I'm joined in the studio by Afshin Ratansi. He's an award-winning journalist and novelist, and he was in Tehran in the run-up to the 2009 Iranian presidential elections. We'll be joined by our studios in Moscow and Washington a bit later on. Uh, Afshin, thank you very much for joining us here. Uh, first of all, your reaction to the news this week. Two names have been taken off the list. What do you think people in Iran will think of that. Uh, Rasan Jani, he was seen as a, a figure that could divide different, that could bring together two aspects of the political divide together. I mean, do, is it significant? Should, what, what, what's your take on it? Well, of course, uh, like in any country, if one was to describe what, what they would think, we'd have to delineate it via class. Uh, the uh, elite uh, uh, mercantile classes of uh, Iran um, Perhaps, uh, well, they're thinking a lot about the sanctions. The uh, massing, massive uh, working class people in Iran, you've got to remember Iran has the largest car industry in the Middle East. You'll see their cars all over the Middle East. Uh, they will be uh, wanting better conditions, which Ahmadinejad during his two terms did give them at the expense uh, of the middle classes. Um, as to uh, these individual candidates, uh, the most important thing now for Iran, and I think the people would realize that, is that they're under siege. Uh, they have occupation troops on all their borders, and uh, uh, in the past 24 hours, the U.S. Senate has passed a resolution basically backing an Israeli uh, attack on Iran and um, saying that President Obama no longer has the right, even as U.S. president, to veto uh, any uh, sanctions even uh, due to national United States security. I'm thinking, of course, of oil sanctions. But those sanctions are in place. Uh, well, the, the disputed sanctions certainly in the international community is divided over them, but they, at the heart of them, is Iran's nuclear program now. I mean, are we going to see any kind of difference in approach to, nu to the nuclear program? In fact, um, a UN nuclear report out today said that Iran is trying to accelerate its uranium enrichment program. Experts don't know, aren't sure whether... Um, machines could start operating or, or how efficiently they would work. But clearly it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an issue that um, isn't just about the United States and Israel. Oh, I'm sure Iran will continue enriching uranium. It's going full speed ahead for its uh, civil nuclear program. There are IEA cameras every day focused on their uh, nuclear enrichment programs. And uh, regardless who wins the June the 14th election, it'll be full steam ahead. Uh, for that, regardless. but won't there be won't there be disappointment? Perhaps people were pe people were looking for uh, an open election. I mean, there would be disappointment, won't there, that two names, two candidates have been barred. In fact, an Ahmadinejad who um, was popular uh, among uh, obviously uh, a, good, a good proportion of the population, he had his man um, taken off the list. But the most important thing uh, for Iranians now, they're, they're under siege. Uh, it would be like saying that. Uh, Cuba, with its uh, U.S. warships surrounding it, should have some sort of uh, election where anyone can go in there. They're, the Israelis are assassinating people on Tehran streets right now. Uh, there are murders up and down the country and spies being hanged. Uh, in this sort of wartime siege economy, the most important thing is for a candidate that unifies the country against what... Uh, one could argue it's a cold war, whether it's even a hot war or that's already started as the United States and its NATO allies try to destroy 
uh, the Iranian government and uh, uh, the Iranian way of life. Yes, but, I mean, are you saying that Ahmadinejad was not effective as president in terms of in t in de in dealing with those issues you've just raised? I think he was very effective indeed. He stopped the war, despite George W. Bush and uh, his successor, President Obama. But uh, there are obviously going to be different concerns. And, there, I mean, there's obviously it's the most democratic country in that region. So the idea of criticizing democracy in Iran seems absurd in the context of uh, its neighbors. But uh, the candidates, uh, there is a reasonably broad spectrum. But uh, I think uh, anyone in the developing world or at the many online movement summits that Tehran hosts would be wishing that Iran stays strong at the moment because it really is under threat. Is it really a democracy, though? I mean, the eight names on the list uh, are approved by the Guardian Council. The Guardian Council, all the members, effectively have... The Ayatollah has the final say over them. What kind of democracy is it? Does the Ayatollah have the final say? Uh, obviously, I'm Nobody speaking, joins the Guardian Council with his, without his approval, though. Uh, does he have total say? When I was in Iran, you know, people would say, why do, why do they always translate it as supreme leader? Is he actually supreme? Don't forget, I'm talking to you from a country, Britain, uh, where uh, the he's, Iranian... He's not the, he's not the... He doesn't have the overall say. He is higher than the president. He has, he's, he's more powerful than the president. Yeah, but has he got the final say over everything that happens in Iran, the Ayatollah Khomeini? Most people would say that he does. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that's actually true. And I think that's, again, a corporate media slur. Don't forget, in Britain, no one voted... Uh, the vast majority of this country didn't vote for David Cameron to be prime minister. Is this a democracy where we have the media owned by such a small minority, where they can ban an Iranian station that criticizes British democracy? I think a lot of people well, around no, the, the, the world... The, the, the Iranian station that you're talking about was banned simply because of um, uh, uh, there were complaints... Um, Ofcom complaints against it, and Ofcom ruled that it would be taken off the airwaves. It wasn't a government conspiracy to take Ofcom it off Ofcom is air. a government censorship agency that bans an entire television station in Britain, it, which is broadcasting information about Iran and about, I'd say, people who are poor in this country who don't vote in democracies here in this we country. Could talk, we could talk about the, uh, the reasons why Ofcom took uh, press TV sure. off, off the air. But, think, but, but just fundamentally to do with Iran, about the I would, election... I would just say that to deal with Iran... Uh, there is massive ignorance about what is happening in Iran and what's happening to Iran, and NATO powers are desperate to uh, stop their populations, their NATO member countries' populations, ever understanding what exactly is going on in Iran. But the people of Iran did want to come out and vote in 2009, and independent analysts said that there was a clampdown and the people were killed. There was, there was, uh, there was a considerable crackdown in violence after the 2009 election, Raf Sanjani himself, uh, he, he spoke on the side of some of the protesters, not all of them. Um, that did happen. So what I want to know is, do you think that could happen again in 2013, June the 14th, after this ballot? Well, I don't think it could happen with any of Raf Sanjani's people because he's not allowed to uh, go for it. Um, Look, this is as I just said. It's under siege. Uh, there are people, there are Israeli and American and maybe even British spies in Tehran. But that's got nothing to do with the election. In well, terms surely of the it election. has something to do with people trying to inspire violence. We know about Operation Gladio in Italy uh, after the Second World War. We know about uh, I don't know how many. I, I don't have enough fingers on my hands to count the number of uh, uh, democratic uh, countries that have been overturned by U.S. Uh, intelligence agencies. Uh, in Africa, in Latin America. But that's not going to happen in Iran. Iran has got, is, is pretty much in control of its own affairs. I think one can never be that sure. You just said the same with President Assad in Syria about two years ago, three years ago. Uh, these countries are being attacked from all sides. And uh, there is just no doubt that NATO powers, and especially Washington, does not want the oil superpower, because that's really what we're talking about, uh, one of the oil superpowers in the world, second only to Venezuela, uh, sitting there and not under uh, U.S. foreign policy hegemonic aegis. OK, so the influence of the United States, is, uh, from what I understand you're saying, is, is with regard to its sanctions um, as well as other things. But in terms of the candidates that will stand on June the 14th, I, I mean, Saeed Jalili has been named as a, as, as a front-runner, potentially. He's the chief nuclear negotiator and some would say a very effective negotiator, I suppose. I mean, what do you make of that? What do you, is, it, is, it the, is it a typical kind of election where you have runners and riders and you, and you have favourites and people who, who fall off the radar? I, I think you're right there, although it's probably very un-Islamic to talk about gambling on which candidate's going to win. I think um, Ali Akbar Veliati, the uh, former foreign minister, uh, my uh, 
hunch is that uh, he has that foreign policy experience, and given it's under attack so much from the West, I'm not sure about Mr. Jalili because, I mean, you, you said he was good at the IEA. I don't even understand the IEA negotiations half the time, and I've been covering them now for... I don't know, more than four or five years. It's uh, bizarre things go on at the International Atomic Energy Agency, especially when the, uh, their um, heads, usually when they resign, say they came under incredible amounts of pressure, political and personal, from Washington. Um, we'll have to wait and see whether Khalibaf drops out in favour of Jalili, which is what Velati was uh, talking about in the past few hours. OK, well, we'll pass to our Washington, D.C. studio and our presenter there, Kim Brown. Thank you so much there, Brandon. Uh, this morning, we're joined in studio here in Washington with Dr. Gawad Bagat. He is a professor of national security affairs at the National Defense University's Near East South Asia Center for Strategic Study. Doctor, welcome again to the show. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Well, we were able to hear uh, some of what uh, the, the London discussion uh, entailed about whether or not I Iran truly is a democracy, obviously, uh, with the list of candidates continually being whittled down. I believe that now the final count is a eight uh, candidates to run for president for the June 14th election. But let, let's talk about really the, the issues that are important to Iranian voters. What are some of the things that will draw Iranians to a particular candidate over another? Uh, first, I believe uh, there are different forms, different definitions of democracy, and it is true that Iran is more open uh, than most of its neighbors, but also probably it is true that Iran is less open than United States or Britain. In terms of the issues of interest to the Iranians, it's very much like here in the United States, like in Europe, like every place, economy. People are the same every place. They are uh, interested in putting food on the table, feeding their families. And probably also in Iran, it is a little bit different because it is very hard to separate economic issues from foreign policy. Mm -hmm. Basically, because of the nuclear issue, Iran is under very comprehensive sanction system. And this is the connection between the economy, national economy, and foreign policy. And let's talk about how Iranians have been faring under these uh, extremely restrictive economic sanctions imposed by the United States and the European Union. Uh, obviously, Iranian oil not uh, for sale, at least uh, legally, on the on the world market. But how are Iranians dealing with these sanctions? Usually with the sanctions, uh, it, it is the middle class and the poor people who generally suffer under these sanctions, while the rich and the elite uh, go about business as usual. How are the people faring? Uh, I believe there are two contradictory points here. The first one, sanctions are hurting the majority of Iranians. The real uh, has lost a great deal of its value. Uh, it's hard to find medicine. Prices are going uh, very high. But at the same time, the Iranians are very proud of their nuclear program. Uh, there is almost some kind of obsession with the nuclear issue, and Iran is still making progress on its nuclear program. I don't want to characterize it as a nuclear weapon or civilian nuclear program, but uh, Iran is enriching more uranium and making progress. So uh, this why, even with the sanctions, uh, still the majority of Iranians support the nuclear program. Mm. In terms of the candidates, however, are there any candidates that are, uh, we understand that one of the uh, uh, former, uh, not weapons inspectors, but Mr. Uh, Saeed Jalali uh, he is part of the IAEA. Are there any candidates that are using this as their platform that, yes, we, we are pro-Iranian, uh, Iranians being in charge of their, of their nuclear sovereignty, as it were. Is anyone campaigning on that platform? Yeah, I, I believe probably there are, again, two ways to approach it. All the candidates uh, support the Iranian program. There is not much difference between them. But on the other side, if you look at the big picture, somebody like Rafsanjani, who was disqualified, were, was more pro uh, normalizing relations with the United States, with the, the rest of the world. So within this context, probably the dynamics could have changed. 
Mm. Also, l- let's also discuss about uh, the actual freedom of, of these elections. Uh, there was a story on Reuters uh, about two days ago that said that uh, the Internet speeds are beginning to slow in Iran. And some of the speculation uh, comes from that, that we are in close proximity to this presidential election. Obviously, with the, with the Green Revolution that happened in 2009 after the disputed uh, re-election of Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, there was uh, uh, the social media was the driving force in getting people out in the streets and for people to be able to coordinate and connect with one another. Uh, Do you believe the story, number one, about the slowing Internet speeds? And do you think it has anything to do with the uh, election looming? No, I would not be surprised if this story is true. And I agree with the discussion we just heard in London. Uh, Iran is uh, facing tremendous challenges from inside and from outside. Uh, all the neighborhood, there are these Arab uprisings. Uh, the economy is in bad shape under uh, sanctions. So to a great extent, Iran cannot afford three democratic election. Uh, they are very interested in stability. Uh, Iran is uh, under siege, under crisis, and they have to be united. Indeed. Well, we are going to toss it over to Moscow this morning. We have our, our presenter in Moscow, Karolina Grachova. Karolina, good day. Duke Chairman of the Russian Iranian Friendship Society, and it's absolutely a pleasure having you here with us. Thank you. We've been carefully listening to what our uh, guests in uh, London and Washington studios uh, had to say whether or not Mahmoud Ahmadinejad is effective as a leader on whether he has a grip, a control, uh, the final say in the country. I would like to talk more about a different side to the story, about um, the world's and Syria's neighbors' efforts to uh, negotiate a peaceful solution, to organize an international conference uh, to negotiate a resolution to the civil war. Mr. Polishuk, a question to you as the chairman of the Russian-Iranian Friendship. Iran is gathering its own peace conference for Syria. Yeah. It claims that it does not, um, it denies any military involvement in Syria. And moreover, Iran's foreign ministry spokesman, Abbas Arakchi, recently said that the upcoming alternative meeting of the Friends of Syria and Tehran is aimed at finding a political solution, bringing all the parties under one tent, um, finding a political solution to the crisis. What is your take on that? Any chances Iran could succeed in that? Uh, you know, well, it's a difficult thing to succeed in such a, uh, well, uh, not an easy uh, to resolve problem, I suppose. And uh, you know that it has uh, started, well, some months, if not years ago. And uh, till now, we don't see any, well, um, easing of tension, actually. And, uh, of course, I think that the uh, Iranian side, they are trying to support the actually, uh, as uh, I'm saying, it is uh, the allies, or one of the allies, uh, limited ones, actually. In the Middle East, uh, East it is uh, Syria. And uh, Iran and Syria, they have an agreement, uh, well, with, uh, I suppose, some military. Um, points in it uh, to support each other in need in difficult situation uh, and uh, that's why it's quite uh, well logical that Iran may of course uh, help uh, Syrian Syria uh, I mean the government of Syria the legitimate government of Syria not rebels uh, with uh, well maybe with money maybe with some other supplies it is uh, quite natural uh, but as to um, uh, resolving the problems, uh, the problem of uh, Syria through negotiations, of course, it is the best way, because we have seen this fighting for many months uh, and without any uh, actual result, uh, but uh, destroying the country, killing the people, and uh, will uh, actually uh, bringing. Uh, uh, this situation uh, into a kind of deadlock because um, uh, forces are almost equal and uh, that's why maybe even I may say that uh, Mr. Uh, well 
the president of uh, Syria. Uh, maybe he has an upper hand uh, to some extent on the situation, but we uh, see that uh, some countries, especially Western countries, they are feeding uh, these rebels uh, with, uh, in many ways and with many things, even with weaponry, uh, though they deny it. And in this situation, the only way, uh, one way uh, remain, uh, remains for, uh, for Iran to help uh, Syrian government. Uh. Mr. Polishukhan, do you believe claims of, uh, of the Iranian leadership that they uh, do not uh, participate in Syrian military in any way? You know, it's difficult. I cannot, well, uh, say instead of them and uh, even deny them because it's they're saying it's official uh, uh, position but I suppose uh, somehow of course Iranian uh, Iranians uh, help uh, Syria even uh, I think in a military way too not uh, well in being involved in this uh, uh, conflict uh, but uh, we can imagine we can uh, think that they as I said before may help uh, uh, the government uh, with uh, weaponry with maybe instructors and uh, you know uh, Hezbollah claimed officially that they will help uh, Syria but uh, they are not connected very closely uh, to, uh, to Iran uh, they are coming from uh, another side, from maybe from Libya, isn't uh, it Lebanon. Sorry, just Lebanon. For, isn't it damaging to have uh, mm -hmm. a two-front uh, solution for Syria? Is it at all imaginable, possible to combine Iranian and American efforts in the peacemaking process? It's very difficult because they have quite, quite uh, well different uh, vision and different ideas uh, about it. So I, I don't see actually any possible real way uh, except maybe uh, well uh, negotiations and maybe during the negotiations parties will uh, find a solution a way out but uh, as I said before military component is very important if forces are equal parties have to negotiate you know and in this uh, situation uh, they will try to find a solution, but you know uh, the opposition or uh, rebels, as we say, they are not uh, united themselves. Yes, they uh, represent uh, different fractions of opposition and different uh, well parties, uh, uh, helped by different outsiders, I should say. That's why it's difficult okay, to just say that uh, they are united. It's, um, with my guest in London, Afshan Ratansi, um, the, issue of, on, Brandon, yeah. the issue of Syria obviously is a key one, but um, there are talks, Russia and American brokered talks due to take place. Um, Iran has a good relationship with Syria, but Iran is not involved in these talks. This has got to be uh, a stumbling block, doesn't it? Iran needs to be at, these, at, this, at the table trying to find an end to this conflict, doesn't it? Um, I haven't myself heard a definite no to the uh, Lavrov broker talks on Syria. Uh, it was surprised me that Iran wasn't keener right at the beginning because it itself had hosted uh, some types of talks, again unreported in the West, uh, that were trying to solve the Syrian situation maybe a year ago. Uh, I presume this is a effect of the elections and uh, uh, like in any country, when there are elections, there's a, th that lack of stability, I suppose. But uh, I think most people would be hoping Iran will be at that table. Russia and China in the past few hours has expressed um, uh, a great uh, a desire that Iran is at the table. Of course, whether President Obama and uh, <laughs> European countries that, of course, are supporting the Salafist, uh, Takfiri Islamists that are murdering people in Syria. Whether they'll want Iran at the table is a different matter. But in terms of having Iran at that table, I mean, clearly it would be, would it not be put Russia and America in a difficult position to have them as the broker for peace, given that Iran is probably Syria's closest ally at the moment in the region? 
well, is Russia not an ally of Syria? They have contracts outstanding. If anything, it's Moscow. If they had just, you know, supplied the S-300 uh, air defense system like uh, had been agreed a year ago, uh, at least we wouldn't have been talking about the possibility of a, another NATO aggression in the Middle East. Uh, so I, I presume one could say that uh, in the same way that Moscow, uh, Beijing, and Tehran are all in allies of Syria. They're, basically, they want stability, and uh, that's obviously something that uh, NATO powers don't want in Syria. Indeed, and uh, but there is talk of, of Iran holding its own peace conference for Syria. Yeah, I, I think, um, I mean, it has had them before as well. Uh, of course, the ones that will hopefully be the best will be the ones uh, uh, where uh, Russia and China are involved. But uh, let's not forget, you know, the, the number's dead. Is it 80,000? Is it 90,000? Uh, you know, it's massive uh, support uh, of the rebels by NATO powers in destabilizing this, uh, after all, secular power in the Middle East. That's my guest, Afshan Ratansi, an award-winning journalist and novelist who was in Iran in the two during the 2009 elections. We'll return to the discussion on Iran after a short news update. You're listening to The Voice of Russia. Here are the news headlines. A 28-year-old British man of Nigerian descent has been identified as one of the men who attacked and killed an off-duty soldier outside Woolwich Barracks in South London. Security services have acknowledged that he was known to them previously. Michael Adebolajo and the other assailant so far unidentified remain in hospital after being shot by police at the scene. The Swedish capital has suffered a fourth night of rioting in the suburbs. Protesters say unemployment and immigration are issues that the government is failing to address. Over 200 cars were set, off, set on fire in Stockholm and there were smaller scale incidents in the regional city of Malmö. The government says immigration numbers in Britain have fallen. Although 500,000 people moved to the UK in the last year, net migration figures are down by about a third. The government has pledged to reduce immigrant numbers to about 100,000. A Japanese man has become the oldest person to reach the top of Mount Everest. Yuichiro Miura is being closely followed up the mountain by an 81-year-old Nepalese rival, so his record may not last for long. Mr Miura, however, first climbed Everest in 2003 when he was 70. At that time, he was the oldest man to climb the mountain, which is 8,848 metres high. That's the news summary from The Voice of Russia. You're listening to The Voice of Russia with me, Brendan Cole, in London with my guest Afshan Ratansi and our studios in Washington, D.C. and Moscow. Afshan, I'd just like to ask your view on uh, the runners and riders, as, as I said earlier on, of, in, in, the, in the presidential election. Quite a conservative list, um, most people would say. But Ahmadinejad, who is the incumbent, would you say that he's been a bit of a thorn in the side of the, uh, of the authorities? He's quite outspoken, and perhaps the Ayatollah hasn't quite been that happy with, uh, with, the, with some of his views. I've, uh, I mean, I've, I've met him a couple of three times, I think. I met uh, President Ahmadinejad. And the, the last time I met him, I definitely got the impression of uh, what uh, uh, you were saying, Brendan, because um, I think he'd, he'd said something about foreign policy that didn't chime in with perhaps the Guardian Council. So uh, I suppose one could say he was being cheeky or slightly naughty. What, what did about he say? It. I think that was a, that was a complex situation about Lebanon, actually, to do with okay. Hezbollah. It, it, too, too arcane now, perhaps, or probably too too up to the minute to be talking about. But definitely, uh, he was, uh, you know, on social issues. Ahmadinejad was much more liberal. He wanted, uh, you know, there were there were rumours that he didn't want uh, compulsory hijab. He wanted women to go to football matches. Uh, he was he was a work he's a working class uh, uh, you know a doctor of uh, traffic management, and uh, what he did was to uh, rip apart the cozy middle class lifestyles of North Tehran, and uh, take their money and just pour it into the uh, ghettos of South Tehran, this huge sprawling city that Tehran is, and again doing that in Shiraz in the south and in Isfahan, uh, the middle classes did not like this. Uh, young worker chap, uh, Mr. Ahmadinejad, but he did an immense amount of uh, good and... and uh, so, quite, so quite socially minded 
in debt if he wanted um, women to go to football matches. He wanted to improve the lot of the poorer people in society. That's got to be seen as a, as a good thing, right? Yeah, of why course. Would, but yeah. why, would, why would the authorities, why would the Atel not, not want that? I think, uh, I think uh, there are more, I mean, still on the principalist, as it's called, vein within the Guardian Council. Uh, it wasn't the social issues so much. Uh, it was perhaps that President Ahmadinejad uh, uh, on, the, on the world stage was uh, uh, perhaps uh, too conservative in Western parlance, as it were, uh, because he certainly, you know, he, he was great friends with the late Hugo Chavez and certainly on the world stage didn't take, uh, uh, lost no chance to uh, uh, upstage his, you know, the, the West who are, are trying to strangle Iran. So perhaps there was a, the, perhaps there was a difference there. But certainly uh, President Ahmadinejad was on the... Uh, liberal side socially, I always felt while living there. We'll go back to our studio in Washington with Kim Brown. Thank you, Brendan. And I'm joined in studio this morning with Dr. Gawant uh, Bagat. And doctor, uh, there was a point you wanted to raise about the Iranian influence in, in what's happening in the Syrian conflict. Uh, thank you. I believe there is uh, one big difference between the uprising in Syria and what happened in Egypt or Libya or other Arab countries. Uh, each Arab uprising is unique in one way, one way or the other. In Syria, probably the main difference is it is more regional war. Uh, in Egypt, it was not regional war. It was the Egyptian people were not happy with uh, Mubarak and overthrew him. The same thing in Libya and Tunisia. In Syria, it is a regional war, mainly between Iran on one side and Saudi Arabia on the other side. And this is why uh, I believe uh, the only way to end the crisis in Syria is somehow to get these regional powers, Turkey, Qatar, Saudi Arabia on one side, uh, Iran, uh, Russia, uh, Hezbollah on the other side, to get into agreement. Uh, it will be very complicated. I cannot see in any way, at least for the time being, that the Iranians will accept to give up Syria. Uh, at the same time, I cannot see Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Turkey uh, will accept to give up on the rebels. So uh, how these regional powers will come to agreement, nobody knows uh, at this moment. One last point I, I want to make uh, also about Iran and the United States. Uh, Iran played a very positive role in stabilizing Iraq and Afghanistan. There were back channel talks and sometime in open between United States and Iran. Uh, Iran is major regional power and uh, negotiations between United States and Iran can help stabilize Syria as it did in Iraq and Afghanistan. Well, the question is, will Iran be publicly in invited uh, to the table? As we're seeing some news coming out of Jordan today with the pro-opposition Friends of Syria meetings, uh, now there's been some talk that the International Peace Conference that was proposed by Russia and the United States, the so-called Geneva II Conference, uh, will not uh, be happening. Uh, according to a spokesperson there, quote, the participants who have declared themselves spokespersons for the Syrian people have blocked the way to the International Conference proposed by Moscow and Washington, saying that they were going to boost support for the Syrian opposition. This is according to the Sana'a uh, news agency there. Um, why isn't Iran present at, at some of these very public meetings uh, regarding Syria, given the level of influence that they have not only in the region, but in that particular conflict? Uh, one of the main challenges, usually people try to speak to their friends and negotiate with their friends, but the bottom line negotiations is between enemies and uh, it is true that Iran is taking sides, Iran is supporting uh, President Assad, but also it is true Saudi Arabia, Qatar and Turkey are supporting the rebels. Uh, most people uh, condemn foreign intervention, but in reality all countries intervene in other countries affairs. Whatever happens in Syria will affect all regional countries, regional powers. So it makes a lot of sense uh, that Israel intervenes. Today in New York Times there was a story about Israel intervening in Syria supporting some groups. It makes sense that Iran intervenes. It makes sense that Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Qatar intervene. Uh, the future of Syria will affect everybody. 
cannot expect these regional powers not to intervene. What, what, are, what are the underlying factors behind basically this proxy war, as you, as you mentioned, that's basically being waged in Syria with uh, Iran on one side and Saudi Arabia and, and others on the other side? Uh, what does Iran have to gain uh, by supporting this regime? To a to great extent, Syria has been the only Arab ally to Iran for, since the revolution, to a great extent. So uh, uh, Iran cannot afford to lose Syria. Uh, Syria is important because it gives Iran connection to Hezbollah, to Lebanon, gives Iran connection to Israel. So uh, I cannot see under any circumstances that the Iranian leaders will accept to lose Syria. The same thing for, for Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is not happy that Iranian influence is growing in Iraq. Saudi Arabia wants to uh, weaken Iran by taking Syria, by making Syria Sunni ruled country. Mm. And I'd like to ask the question uh, to, to our guest in, in Moscow, Mr. Uh, Polishuk. Uh, Alexander, if you could give us an idea uh, about the way that the Iranian presidential elections could possibly uh, affect, change, or even remain the same, uh, the Iranian positions in both Syria and Iraq. Uh, you know, it will depend on uh, the uh, cat. Uh, I don't think that uh, very big changes we may expect uh, in Iranian position in uh, any uh, well uh, way. Uh, maybe it will be softened uh, a little bit, uh, but uh, as previous uh, speakers also uh, said, say uh, it is uh, impossible for uh, Iran to allow uh, Syria uh, to be uh, actually to be destroyed or uh, to be uh, captured by other forces um, but not um, not uh, uh, supported by the allies and uh, the main players are, no, are Russia and China I think of course Iran is also important and without Iran it is not possible completely to resolve this problem as a whole you know even with involvement of uh, big uh, powers because iran is uh, interested uh, well badly very uh, in uh, this uh, um, keeping uh, syria uh, near his its uh, borders approximately near because iraq also now a good uh, place uh, for expanding Iranian influence. And, you know, it is a very old saga. It started, I suppose, maybe 2,000 years ago with uh, mm, uh, wars between uh, Greeks and Iranians. It was the first clash of Western and uh, Eastern civilizations. And this line, you know, well, was drawn exactly well through Syria and Iraq. I'm sorry, Mr. Polishuk, for jumping in as time is pressing. Since you've mentioned uh, civilization aspect, is it possible at all that we do not fully understand Iran? Because, for instance, Iranian society strikes foreign visitors with compatibility of seemingly incompatible things. I will never forget my first trip to Armenia. That was in spring during the, the major Muslim fest of Qurban by Ram. And it was literally flooded with the thousands of Iranians who crossed the border to spend um, the, what, what is the street land period for them yeah. in their home country uh, to go to Armenia I was um, I found it appalling girls were wearing mini skirts um, they um, uh, did not observe uh, observe books um, they were holding hands with boyfriends how does this all um, match with the with a quite widespread opinion in the Muslim world that the Iranians in particular uh, the one people at home and different somewhere else. What do you think on that as the chairman of the Russian-Iranian Friendship Society? Yeah, thank you very much for your question. It's not so difficult, I suppose, to understand Iranians. Uh, be why? Because you know, they have to uh, wage, uh, well, uh, two lives maybe, official and unofficial. 
and uh, it is uh, rather well may uh, seem a little bit strange but it not uh, so uh, un uh, well un understandable i should say why because uh, you know they well, simple people people in the street uh, actually they of course believe believe in, in the god they uh, are muslims but they are more uh, more or less uh, Westernized people too, and uh, first of all, and secondly, uh, they their culture, uh, well, uh, actually it is um, well, it, its roots go uh, go to uh, times before uh, Islam, before Islam. Uh, the Azor Zoroastrians. Well, it it influences very much their life. Sadly, the Azor Zoroastrians. It it influences very much their life too. Now they are. Okay. They have two. Unfortunately, we're, running, we're, we're sorry to interrupt. We're, we're running out of time. We've only got um, less than a minute left. But uh, that's our guest in Moscow with our host, Katya Grachova. That's Alexander Polichuk, chairman of the Russian-Iranian Friendship Society. Just finally, my guest here in London, Afshin Ratansi. Um, the elections next month, we, uh, in, in the aftermath of the 2009 elections, and you were in Iran at that time, we saw the Green Movement. It was incorrectly referred to as the Green uh, Revolution earlier on, but the Green Movement. Do we see, do you anticipate a similar sort of thing happening uh, post-June 14th? There'll be all sorts of instability, but just very quickly, I would say that, you know, Iran may have loads of variegated complexities that the Orientalist tropes, there are so many of them. But someone from Mars would say uh, societies like Britain and America are far weirder than anything in Iran, given it's them that are creating all the wars. Iran hasn't created any wars for, what, since the 7th century? Indeed. Well, look, we'll have to leave it there. Sadly, we've run out of time. But the, uh, the election takes place on June the 14th. The Western media will be closely following that. Uh, that's my guest here, Afshan Ratansi. And he's an award-winning journalist and novelist who was in Tehran in 2009 during the last elections. Uh, our presenter in D.C. was Kim Brown. Her guest was Gaudet Bhagat, who was Professor of National Security Affairs at the National Defense University and Katya Grachova in Moscow. Stay tuned. Coming up, we have Curtain Up, our weekly cultural look at Russia and our program is about Russian culture in the capital. In this edition, Alice Lignado speaks to the writer Andrew Upton about his new adaptation of Gorky's play Children of the Sun for the National Theatre here in London. That's up next.